when he walked into my uh, father's chambers um, with some silly problem about Western Apple Studios. And uh, we were both young, we had both started our careers. Um, I don't think we were that interested in the discussion that was going on, but that's how we first met. And then I think I am delighted to say that we've been part of most of Ronnie's journeys. Uh, when he started UTV, when he uh, went on to work with Disney, when he bought Vijay TV, when he did Hangama. And I think that uh, when he started his uh, Unilaser Ventures after he had sold out to Disney, I remember phoning him up because we were doing all these agreements for him with all these venture companies. And I remember phoning him up and saying, Ronnie, what are you doing in Brass, for God's sakes? So he laughed and he said, I'll let you know when they do well. And then I got an SMS a couple of years later saying, that's the company. But I think uh, what you will hear from Rani today is a couple of things which is his hallmark. One, he prides himself and has succeeded in being disruptive. Uh, what amazes me when I was just going through a few chapters of his book is that he invites failure almost. I try and stay away from it as much as I can. But he counsels you to have no fear of failure and he basically says failure fascinates me. So I think you should learn from that. That's not many people say that. The other thing that we've seen throughout the last two days is again something which is uh, Ronnie invites as a typical successful entrepreneur, which is hard work. When we were doing deals with Ronnie, he would want impossible turnaround timelines, and the only thing we couldn't say no to him was because he was reading every word himself, and he was coming back and telling us where we were not drafting it correctly ourselves. So we kept our mouth shut. And then, of course, Ronnie took certain life decisions. Um, one is when he decided to sell out to Disney. I remember a 12 o'clock midnight conversation at home with his wife. Should I, shouldn't I, should I, should I, would I, would I. And I think Ronnie has succeeded in monetizing his journey with UTV, not twice, which is typical, but thrice. So, uh, and then the next conversation came when Ronnie had to be managing director at Walt Disney. I really want to be managing director. He said, you could be an expensive managing director. And then that wasn't enough for Ronnie. So he gave that up. And of course, for me, the pride of Ronnie is where he and Zarina have gone in Swadesh. Uh, he's put his money where his heart is. Um, and as we know, uh, what you give with the good spirit of God, you get back in return. And Ronnie has got the balai, as they say, of millions of people. And, as is typical of Ronnie and Zarina, who is by far his better half, which he will admit, is that they don't want to touch just hundreds of lives. He's already aiming for a million, and I don't think Ronnie will stop. And so I think what he should tell you about is what he was telling me about when he came over for coffee a couple of weeks ago, that he has his new TV, UTV2, upgrad.com. And I think that would be fascinating for the audience. So from the Indian Super League to the Kabaddi something or the other, to a sports foundation, I think Ronnie has really become the complete entrepreneur. He's run the full cycle, but the cycle isn't over for him yet. And so Ronnie, we're really glad you didn't become a chartered accountant. We're glad you became the classic entrepreneur. We're so glad you're giving back some of what you got. And of course, all this Ronnie has bribed me to say. But what he hasn't bribed me to say is, I love you, Ronnie. Welcome.
So look, I've got half an hour, and I, I actually made a few notes on, on the flight because I thought, here's a different kind of an audience. It's just on a lighter moment to sort of start off. And I think Gopi set the trend this morning when he, when you normally want to share experiences and learning lessons, the best way to do it is with storytelling. And I come from an industry that does storytelling. So the best I can do in the next half an hour is try and share a few of my learning experiences, a few of my storytellings. And I think on a lighter note to start off when I was calling in and saying, so what's the sort of broad spectrum of our audience here today? And many people said, uh, one or two described it, said we're going to have a lot of investors and then we're going to have a lot of entrepreneurs. And I wanted to just understand, so, you know, early stage entrepreneurs, people who build companies, which sector? And the answer I got was, uh, entrepreneurs who've, uh, who've done Series B and going into Series C funding. And coming back to me on a really lighter note, I thought that's an introspection. Is that how we want to really be described? I think we should be described as entrepreneurs who have built businesses or what sector we're in and not how much the money we raise. So it's just a sort of a reflection point for me as well as I describe. And I think it's something everyone needs to keep in mind. So I want to first start by saying that the sort of four C's that mostly impact my life, I learned very early in my career. One was uh, conviction, because I think you can't really go forward without that. Second, communication skills. And I was just listening to this recent uh, documentary that Warren Buffett came out on the weekend, which is a nice documentary that was made. And he said, I've thrown away all my Columbia certificates. The only certificate I have on my wall is this uh, part-time course I went to because I was introvertish about learning the importance of communication. And the third one for me is generally the element of clarity of thought. And the fourth is collaboration. And those four things I was very fortunate to, hear, uh, to learn in my theater days. When I was young, I used to do theater. And I can tell you that experience for me was life changing and made a lot of what I do now here. It was a hobby at that particular time. The money that we made on weekends was just about enough for me to do my dates. But overall, it was an incredible experience because when you're on stage with a thousand people every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, you learn everything you need to know about confidence. You need to know everything you need to know about collaborativeness because you're sitting there, you've got five more people on stage, and if you get a line wrong, you're letting four other fellow people on, on stage off. And it's those experiences, and I think it's important for each of us in our own spectrum when we learn what we learn. What are the factors? And I think most important today really for key leadership is communication. And I know for a lot of people that feels, well, I may not be the most eloquent speaker and I may not have the best diction. And I don't think it's about eloquence and, and diction. It's just about whichever way you feel you can communicate well, I think that's critical and important. And that's, to me, the four C's I think that stayed out with me. So just in my early days, I think a couple of lessons that I learned. One, when we started cable TV, there were three key lessons that I learned at that stage. Uh, the element of staying with your conviction. For almost the full first year, one would have thought if I want to go out and sell to people who are only watching one TV channel, that you've got to announce a second TV channel of your choice, wow, everyone should be taking that. For the first full one year, we couldn't get a single customer in Mumbai. And I can tell you there were many, many days in that process where I felt, maybe I'm not cut out to be an entrepreneur, maybe I should be going with that. And then we went door to door. I, I had a team of only five people at that stage because we were bootstrapping and starting out. And that experience of interacting with customers firsthand, getting the door banged on you a lot of times. People coming and telling you, don't come at 5, come at 9 p.m. at the night, come at 10 p.m. at the night. And then calling you into, and the biggest challenge for cable TV at that stage, I remember, was how is the cable going to go into my flat and how is it going to be concealed? So we were suddenly architects, designers, cable TV operators, and everything. But being so close to the customer, figuring out that I'm not going to give up because this is really a fantastic challenge, and third, being extremely frugal were great learning experiences for me when I started cable TV. Later on, when we got into accidentally uh, manufacturing toothbrushes, which was most unlike what we did in media, I learned the real art of being opportunistic. And I think you can be opportunistic and then you need to be strategic and then as you grow older and you grow wherever. But at that stage, the idea of being able to seize an opportunity, which you may not know much about at that stage because you felt, here was something that I found and here was a real market. 
was something that gave me a lot of confidence at that early stage. And I think opportunistic was very much important. And a never say no approach. You are going to find a market. You are going to get it done. I found two second-hand machines in toothbrushes in a factory in UK that I accidentally happened to visit with my father, quite incidentally. And from that, I came back and said, I've got to find a market for toothbrushes. But I guess sometimes naivety helps because when you're naive, you can take bolder decisions, you can take even more risks. So I think there's always that element of naivety and curiosity that I think needs to stay with you at whatever stage and at whatever age you be. And I think that makes an incredible difference. And third was home shopping, which we started. And I think a couple of lessons that I learned there. One was always have a survival plan and not always a success plan. I think most of us sit down there and make success plans for everything. We make it out and we always know that the revenue side will never be the success plan and the cost side will always remain what it's supposed to be. But the fact of the matter is that if you can actually have a survival plan while you're having a success plan, it's your private plan, but it's something that will allow you because most of us today don't know when we're pioneering something, whether we're before our time or we've got it right. And we've got two choices when we've got it wrong. One, we slow down and stay the course because we feel, okay, this is about, I'm one year early or two years early in the sector and I can take it to the next level. Or I wrap up and go away. And I think a survival plan for a lot of us when we realize that what we thought was our best case scenario has turned out to be a worst case scenario helps a lot. And I think that was my sort of early lessons when it came to that. Really, as far as the media goes, the best way I can sort of describe the journey for a relevant audience here is to go through it through the eyes of the investor pattern that I went through. Number one, we started off because I started off as an absolute first generation entrepreneur. And at that stage, there was no concept of VC, PE, those alphabets were not in anybody's mind. So you had absolutely no question of being able to raise any money. So first, frugality came into the context, and second for us, it was an element of B2B. So we couldn't really go out and be a B2C company overnight, especially in media which people had a huge challenge to figure out. And it was critical for us to become a B2B model. So for the first five years, we built a B2B model. Five years later, we attracted Warburg Pinkers to be the, it was their very first investment in India. They just celebrated 20 years in India. And Chip, who is still the CEO of the company, and we were nostalgic about this thing, their absolutely first investment in India and in media in Asia as far as that is concerned. They were very early days. And that was the first time I was selling a chunk of a company uh, that I had started off and bringing in private equity five years after we'd actually been as frugal as we would be and built a basic business, but enough for somebody like Walk Winkers too. And I think the other cross learning for me was as he expanded, as a side attraction, we went from Singapore and Malaysia because at that time there was a lot happening uh, to diversify our media company because I thought I wanted to be global. And I'll come back to learning lessons on global a little later. Um, and it didn't work out because uh, the Asian crisis hit us. And as it is, those were small markets in media and entertainment and it shrunk. And I remember sitting there with Warwick Pinkers who had then invested. They were excited about their investment in India, so they invested us in Singapore and in Malaysia. And we stopped and we said, we're going to shut down these two operations. Because, and that's another learning, when to pull the plug. And we said, we were not going to stay there. And I sat down with the Warburg team. And I said, look, I think you've lost a little bit of our money here. We're still, our principal investment is in India. And I'm going to top it up for my investments. Whatever is my shareholding, I'll give you some of it. So that you're back at cost price in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur into India. And I can tell you today, that was, to me, one of the most, at that stage, obviously, I didn't think too much about it. I just did it as a natural reflex. But that investment was incredible. Because for the next 20 years, I couldn't have found a better ambassador for anything that I wanted to do, raise any money, or go to any level of any interaction. And I would strongly recommend that for people. And later on, when I sort of facilitated their exit to a Canadian fund called CDPQ, very interesting, because I inherited the first, what I would call, visually impaired board member. Uh, he was blind, phenomenally intelligent person. And I can't express to you how many board interactions I've had with diverse people from a Disney and a News Corp and a Bloomberg to many other investors. But this was incredible because all he'd get was his presentations online. And he'd be asking the sharpest questions in the room. I could never win an argument with him on 
any point. And then when I was working to look at an exit for him, it was the toughest time he ever gave me. And it was a phenomenal learning lesson for me at that stage. So that's the third part of the journey. And then came the time when as first generation entrepreneurs, you still feel you need to raise more money, but you don't want to dilute. So what do you do? You look at this concept, which is, this, is the sum, is the whole bigger than the sum of the parts. And let me explain that to you, and it rung to me, because when Rupert Murdoch came in and made an investment into uh, UTV, we made an audio visual for him that says, the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. And then just a year later, after he had actually made that investment, um, we were looking at how would we would diversify the company. So three weeks after he came into our basement office uh, to make the investment, and I, and I remember because he was walking down through the basement office, and I said, one thing we gotta do is get our toilets clean here, because all of these people, when they come down, they feel out. They make judgment calls on how clean your toilet is. I, I think so. I make judgment calls on companies based on really how you're keeping your house clean. And I thought, now, he's gonna come for 45 minutes, He's not going to ask for the loo. The first thing he gives is, where's the restroom? You know, so, and that was a quick learning lesson for him. Four weeks later, he summoned uh, us to, about me, to UK saying, come across. And at the B Sky B office, before I knew it, I was dealing with nine investment bankers. One of them today heads Ambit, the other one heads PwC at that stage. And here was me all alone. And we banged out a, a term sheet. The learning lesson for me there was I didn't ask the strategic question as to why you're investing 49% to the company. And so what transpired after that is that Murdoch, who had then at that state bought Star TV from Lee Kashin, uh, also partnered with Subhash Chandra at Z. And because they had signed up an exclusive contract with Z for the next 10 years would have dominance in the Hindi market, they needed an investment and a placeholder uh, in content. So here I was, having had a, uh, an absolutely rock star of an investor, the second investment after over because my company, but a completely non-strategic investment, taking 49% of your company. Huge learning curve as far as that is concerned, where it made a big difference to me because here I was trying to expand a company where I had the pedigree, but the 49% shareholder was extremely supportive, but not strategic in their approach. And therefore, when you're looking at some of the elements of even your strategic partners, what does that really mean for you? The next step for me was, as I said, I decided that to go ex exactly against the grain and said, you know what, when you want to raise money and you don't want to uh, dilute your parent company, start forming subsidiaries. So start forming subsidiaries and do step-down subsidiaries so that you can say, broadcasting one subsidiary, this and that and the other and whatever else. And I couldn't and actually the best advice at that time I got ever was not to do that process. And I know most of our reactions are, we can't do that, let's form a subsidy, let's raise money in here, let's raise money in here. And I can only tell you that the whole is always bigger than the sum of the parts when it comes to that, as far as consolidation is concerned. Because if I had done it that way and raised different investors in different part of my three or four subsidies and not in the whole, we would never have created a brand, we would never have created the next journey for me was therefore looking at a listing and an IPO. And that was interesting because we moved forward as far as that is concerned. Um, and the first analyst investment that I had in being a listed company or media, they started asking questions of which I had to say I didn't have any answers because we were primarily a B2B company. And when you're a B2B company, you're not in control of your own destiny, you're not building a brand. And therefore I realized at that moment after that first analyst course, call three months after we listed the company that I needed to actually metamorphosize the organization into a B2C organization. And so I called in the board team and I said over the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to morph ourselves into a B2C company. In 30 days, I realized that by becoming a B2C company, every activity that I would get into would be a direct competition to all my B2B customers. And therefore, I would not only have to morph myself into a B2C company, but I would have to shut down all my B2B activities of what we were doing. We were doing airline programming, we were doing ad films, we were producing television programs for all the broadcasters in India. Everyone was our customer and client. And here we were going to become a broadcaster, we were going to become a movie studio, we were going to become a game studio. And therefore, that was the contradiction. And it took us 18 months, but it was the absolute right thing to do. 
and that brought us face to face with the Walt Disney Company. And again, part serendipity and part strategy, because we were looking at starting a kids channel as one of our forays. Um, and I'll, you know, when we get to why, what not to do, the conviction for us was obviously at that stage when we were starting out. Every single naysayer in the uh, book told us there's no way you should be starting a kids channel because we had all the big multinationals already operating in the space, from Cartoon Network and Turner and Disney and everyone else. And here we were the outsider in the, in the lot, trying to start a kids' channel. So what possible impact could we make? And it took us a fair amount of conviction, and for the first one year, I have to say, everyone who said we were wrong was right, because nothing worked for us at that stage. Uh, and again, it took a lot of resilience. But at the end of that, it gave us a lot of flexibility. Because what I realized was with all the multinationals, all they had was zero flexibility because they were going to dump their content, their global content in India and we had all the flexibility. So we went to Japan and picked up two shows that even till today, almost every mother catches me even though we've sold the company eight years back and said, you're the guy who brought Shin Shan to India and my kids are never going to whatever, whatever, whatever. And I can see some, oh yeah, looks out here. Um, and that's exactly that. We took two shows called Doraemon and Shin Shan. We became the number one uh, kids channel six months after the 12 months, which was in 18 months. I took out a full page um, ad with complete arrogance in the Economic Times saying we were the number one uh, channel. And the next day I got a call from uh, Disney saying, do you want to sell your channel? So I said, well, no, obviously not. Why would I want to sell it? We're just starting up our B2C journey. But in 30 days, one thing led to another. They said, well, look, we don't make minority investments, but we'll take a 14% stake in UTV, but if you sell us the kid's channel. And it made eminent sense to me uh, at that particular point in time. And so we divested our kid's channel to Disney, who had, uh, you know, just 18 months back, we were in direct competition with them for the entire 18 months, and inherited an incredible partner who then grew to 50% and then finally, uh, over a period of time, made an offer that says, why don't we just buy the entire company and then move forward. So I think that's the growth, but I think many of the learning lessons that I kind of summed up here between the Warburg Pinkus one and really letting investors understand what you mean, because I think we think too short term sometimes when we think of that. Understanding strategic partners, and the only one in this whole chain that I may have missed is our relationship with Bloomberg. When I started a business channel, again, purely out of ego, uh, and I had to knock myself on the head for that, because I just thought, well, you know, CNBC was there, and they were a global brand, why do we start an Indian brand in that? So we started a brand, and I, Disney was there, so I called it ABC UTV, but that didn't work because CNBC was there. And then I went after Bloomberg, and Michael Bloomberg was very, very clear he would not permit or license anyone to use the Bloomberg plan anywhere in the world unless he was in complete control of the content. And that wouldn't happen due to FDI restrictions in India. Anyway, almost two years passed, but every three months I would figure out a way to drop into New York accidentally to meet with Bloomberg and tell them, you know, we're still here, this is what's happening, here's the market, it's so exciting. And then perseverance helps, because at the end of two years, they suddenly said, look, we're looking at our strategy in Asia, and we can see that this is FDI, and this, this owning content is not going to work. They also got a huge reference check from Disney by that time. And then we, with that resilience, formed a JV in India for Bloomberg uh, and UTV. So I think that's the sort of path and journey when it came to that, huge learning lessons from that. But, a couple of things that I just like to talk about when it comes to learning. First is structured time and unstructured time. For a lot of us, I learned in media that there's so many things that one needs to do which is unstructured. Because creativity, brand building, marketing ideas, raising, uh, you know, just building people and excitement in the company and actually building a task force is a very creative function. And then you've got the structured elements. You've got to do HR, you've got to review, you've got to do business planning. And suddenly you carve out your time between the structured time and the non-structured time. And I think that was a massive learning for me. And it almost got me two working days in one day. And that's how you suddenly decide, wow, before you know it, it's a 14-hour working day before you know it. Because basically you've got the working hours when you're looking at your structured time. 
and then every evening, every weekend was the unstructured time. But I don't think I would have built the organization in any form or manner if I hadn't had a great combination of structured time and unstructured time. And what I mean by unstructured time is meetings that do not have an end point. Whether you like it or not, there will be brainstorms and sessions that you can't structure in a box. And I think you need to understand in each of your businesses, you may be brand building, you may be innovating, you may be destructive, you may be building uh, anything across an, an intellectual property. But there is this structured time and sometimes you need to let the unstructured time breathe because that's when some of your people will stay with you a lot longer. And I think the longevity of the people that stay with us is because when they respected unstructured time, when they felt, look, I'm a technology guy, why do you tell me to come to a meeting between 11 and 12 and if we are running out of time, five people look at their watch, I can't give you an idea, I can't give you a call. So that is something that I think was an important learning for me there. And I think culture, was the other one, and scale. I know a lot of people, all of us think, where do we go for scale? And you know, I need to say a caution because I interact with a lot of entrepreneurs today also. Most people think scale is, I'm going global, or I'm going pan India, or I'm gonna raise more money so I can spend more money so I can increase my revenues. I don't think that's the answer to scale at all. You've got to build your business meticulously to scale. The business has to naturally scale. You're not going to be able to, if raising more money to scale your business is not thinking scale. I think today, 2016, when there's a correction in many of the startup economies, it's not only because of drying up of funds, but it's a lot about many of us having expanded on a national footprint when we had no business to do that. We had no capability and competence to do that. Our organization was not ready to do that. We didn't understand the complexities of the diverse race of culture, taste, food, fashion, which consumption pattern, communication, positioning, anything on a pan India basis. So of course India is a massive scale opportunity, but we've got to look at scale as not something where you can raise money and get to scale or do whatever else. And I think that's something that, I, that has been a constant uh, search question as far as I'm concerned. And that's just sort of the broad points I want to sort of leave there with you. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about exits, because most people think, you know, um, we build companies to exit them, which obviously cannot be the case. I mean, there's no possible way in which you can time an exit. And I'll give you many of the examples. The first thing we did, we started cable TV, and six years later, I did sell the business. Uh, but at that stage, it became so unstructured that there is no possible way I could have run that business with the ethics or the regulations that I wanted to run with. And I had a CEO who was leaving, and he said, I'm, I'm going across. And I said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to join somebody in the south of India, a large group, to start cable TV. So I said, you know what? Why don't you buy this company and take it forward and go forward? And I was just half joking. He went back, told them, and they made a proposition, and we moved out. Now at that particular stage in life, it was not conceptualized. I didn't start cable TV because I knew I was going to sell it. When I started Two Brushes, it was a great business, but obviously it was left brain thinking for me. It was not something that media and Two Brushes go together. But the time in which it was always giving me a great source of revenue. But at the stage in which I found that my new score relationship with Modoc was not strategic and I had to buy him back before I could go out and do an IPO. I had to sell my toothbrush of a business to buy back the 49% that I had divested with new stock as far as that was concerned. Was that strategic in a thought process that I was building a company? Absolutely not. We, the first channel we invested before we got into uh, Hangama was a channel called Vijay TV. We were bought uh, from the earth by Vijay Malia when he was uh, looking at and he had that and I think for multiple reasons. And two years later, Star TV came on board and. I made them a proposition that says, look, your presence is not there in any of South India, the four languages, so why don't we all come together and form a 50-50 JV? And we did, in a good period of time. That was the only strategic thing from my 49% uh, that came out. And then, like most MNC uh, culture, if I can call it, we did it with arrogance, uh, they said, well, look, look, but you're not going to run the company. Uh, we'll go ahead and run the company. So I said, yes, but then you need to be accountable for the revenue. So two business development guys made a very aggressive business plan for the next five years of how this company under fair management versus ours was going to grow 10, 
get full. So I said, will you give a minimum guarantee for that? Because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So they signed a revenue minimum guarantee, which was way out of any wildest imagination that I could ever have. And we said, okay, fine, then you go ahead and run the company. Obviously, in the first year, they made 20% of that target. And in the 18 month, they had to make a proposal on a DCF value of the last five years to buy us back from Vijay TV. So, and here we did the deal together. You were on the opposite side of that. <laughs> So, was it planned? Did I get into broadcasting and video TV with that? Absolutely not. And then if you look at the more recent one, was Disney. As I said, I started a kids channel and I got a call out of the blue and I think it made into a great partnership. At the stage in which Disney had 14%, I was ready to start building in investors at subsidiary levels. And they were the ones who kept saying, no, no, we'll keep investing in the top, stop floating subsidiary. And that's how they grew it to about 50%. And then they were on our board, obviously, at 50% shareholders, and we discussed strategy. And I would obviously sit, because Disney India also operated there, to help with their strategy. And every time we started strategizing, it almost sounded like we were seeing the same things in both the companies, which is when they popped the question and said, you know, why don't we just combine the two entities? And if you want to run it for some time, fine, but we want to acquire it. Now, obviously, that was a hard decision, but not too hard, because for me, having built a brand for 15 years, to give it to what I would call the number one brand in the world, who understands media, no, and nobody else understands that level of brand affinity more than the Walt Disney Company does, was an incredible sense of pride and joy, which made it strategic. I had 1,200 members uh, who were very proud to hold a UTV card, but I know it would have been three times more proud to hold the Walt Disney card uh, as a visiting. Um, and I was at 23 to 24% shareholding in the company. And I knew that media is something where you'd have to raise the next $200 million for what you wanted to do. And therefore, at that crossroad, it was very clear that at some stage when I drop and we do the next fundraise and I'm at 15%, I'll question myself of whether who am I really working for. And therefore, for all of those elements, it made complete sense to sort of look at that option that was staring at me and somebody would pop the question. So if you look at these, none of them were, were exits that were ever planned. Because if you go into that, what are you building? Not your vision, you're building it because you think in the eye of the beholder what somebody will think of your business four years down the line. Can anyone build a business with that? Absolutely not. And on a smaller tent, even with Hangar, because exit still date now is a little, but when we sold UTV, I got a lot of brickbats from people. Everyone used the word abandonment for every time I said the word exit. How could you abandon your company? But when we sold Hangar, every single person wagged their head, uh, finger at us and said, you had this plan. It was, a, it was a total strategy. You started this to sell the channel. And I said, I don't think you get it. Because firstly, if we had built the kids channel because we thought the Walt Disney Company would be a great, we wouldn't have got Shin Shang, we wouldn't have got Doraemon because that's so non-Disney as family values. We wouldn't have been able to do that under any circumstances. So we'd have built a completely different company. And I wouldn't have called the channel Hungama because for 30 days after that, everyone in Burbank in Los Angeles couldn't pronounce the channel's name and they were buying it. So I would be, obviously, there was no context to premeditate it. So I think it's important when you introspect to think out what you're doing as far as that is concerned. Exits are never planned. And for people who are thinking that IPO is a good way to go, it's a challenging environment out there. You're giving and facilitating investors an exit policy, which is perfectly fine. But to be ready to run a public company in whichever form you are, you need a certain critical mass, you need a very different discipline, and your entire mindset and thinking is going to have to be half strategic and half quality, whether you like it or not. You're going to have to address the people. You can't say, I'm going to look at this in a very different way. Some people can, most people can't. So that's just the last part of what I want to sort of leave behind here. And uh, I would have liked to talk a little bit about my second innings, but I think we're running out of time, except to say that when I finally sold the company, there was an earth shattering moment. I described a little bit of the multiple 12 midnight calls of should we, should we not. And then for two years I continued as the managing director of the Walt Disney Company, which was the first two years I never worked for myself in my entire career.
great learning, incredible learning. Uh, and then when I left that, I think that was a much more penny dropping moment that I was completely moving out of media and entertainment because I had not competed for a long period of time. And that 10 days of a break that I took, uh, uh, which was the longest break I've ever taken to New Zealand, and I think maybe it's the constant sound of great water and fantastic scenery that opens your mind beyond belief. It's the first time I kind of realized uh, that I might be actually now I can look for a job without really needing a job. And I was blessed enough to do that, I was fortunate enough to do that. And I can't throw up this opportunity. And I remember my dad's words, because even when I was 45, he would come at me like a good Parsi person and says, I just don't understand what you're doing. You're still on a rented house. I'm looking at the annual report and you're still, uh, you're the lowest paid executive in your company in the annual report. Uh, you're borrowing money to send your daughter to school and you don't have any mutual funds. So, you know, mutual funds is the passing thing because you've got to have some mutual funds, you've got to have something there to buy you So at 45, I was still having this conversation thinking by now you have figured out that it's okay that his son became an entrepreneur. But no, he was still looking at the grass that was the cup that was not half full and saying, I don't kind of get it. So if that's what you went through and then when you finally have, and it was, because I think when you are in your own company, you just double down, you reinvest whatever you've got, you take the clips on your salary, and on the bad days when you can't do it, you're going to take no salary. This is the first time that I felt slightly liberated, and I think three things struck me in those 10 days. One, what did I want to do for the next 20 years of my life? And I think the word impact came to me strong. And mind you, I think media creates impact. And I think movies are great storytelling. And I think we have created a lot of impact in what we've done in our first. But impact to me was a strong word. Second was no dilution. I wanted to own companies that I didn't want to go out and, and dilute in on. So I think those were the trigger points for me, really, to figure out exactly what I wanted to do with my second innings. And in brief, there are five brands that I went out. One, I think, is Upgrad where we're looking at really building careers of tomorrow. We believe the future is in online. We believe that actually in India, in the, sec in the higher education space, there are almost 80 million people at any given time who should be in higher education and are not. And the only reason for that is because they need to work and they can't, not that they can't afford to study, but they just need to continue to work. And our brick and mortar is not going to solve it. It's going to take us 10 years. We're going to need to be spend $100 billion in India if we want to solve the education problem in higher education with only brick and mortar. And this is without having the right faculty. And we believe online will, will change that. And our biggest focus is only of careers of tomorrow. So there are only two words in which we focus, data and digital. And anything to do with data and digital is what we want to do. Because we believe today learning experiences do not stop when you are 22 or 23 or 25, almost every four to five years in your career, all of us have to revamp ourselves in some form. And that's what we did with uh, Upgrade. I think in our sports, it was again really good fun because I think if I look at the fortunateness with which I'm looking at the, the, the period that I'm in right now, I'm excited about the fact that there's so much interconnectivity between education, sport, and media. Storytelling is common in them. Building talent from ground upwards is in them. And actually making an impact. And I think so, these are the three core focus of businesses in mind. Therefore, whether it's youth sport with Kabaddi and something that we're doing in football, we're doing something in e-sport, we're doing something in motorsport, and we're doing something in martial arts and building a sports organization. Uh, and the third one is in media, where I still feel, having had my five year non compete, that I want to go out and make movies. Because today, the audiences and storytelling is completely I think I was the outsider when we started our movie studio. And for a lot of people here, the last thing I would like to say is we always believe there are these big multinationals and a lot of people come and say, how do I take on the big boys? And I'm saying, I don't see how that question should be relevant to all of us. I mean, today if you look at, for example, Levers, phenomenal company, but they're gonna find growth extremely difficult. Firstly, they've got to 100% saturation of their territory. They can't really saturate any more in that. Second, India is growing in aspirations. And aspirations are going to be when people spend money on things other than soap and toothpaste. And second, third, Patanjali. So 
But when you got, when you got, when you got, I don't think when Nirma Patanjali came in, they were thinking, how do I take on the big boys? They just went out to do it. And I think when you want to figure out what you want to do, you just got to go out and you got to do it. If we had figured out in Hangama that how can we start a kids' channel when we got seven major BMOTs sitting out there running, pumping in 5,000 hours, they're already amortized programming, we would have done it. When we started a movie studio, we were 90 years into an established, incestuous industry where if you didn't know everyone in there, you hadn't played with them and they're from the swimming pools in those early days, there was absolutely no business for you to be in that business. So the only thing we could do is not join them. So the phrase of, if you can't beat them, join them, absolutely not. Because then you've got to go the exact opposite way. Which means that you've got to find narratives. And to us, it was extremely important to work with younger directors, because here we were, and we could connect with them. And for us, having understood audiences when we were doing television and broadcasting, we knew that the younger audiences were looking for something else. And our first five movies were a complete disaster. So for a lot of people, when you're getting in there, and I remember our CFO coming in and saying, we should be in this business. Go find a partner, do something in that. And if he had, it would be a different story altogether. But our sixth movie was Rangde Basanti. And I think that was the changing point, because we stayed with the conviction of not going with beat them, join them. So for anyone who's going and asking, do I take on the big boys? Do I go against the Absolutely. But there's only one way to do that. Just do it. If you start mulling over it and start thinking about it too much, chances are you're not going to do that. So I'd like to end with just two phrases that I go with a lot. Um, you know, one, and I feel that a lot on my uh, morning walks, is that the happiest people are the ones who are solving the most difficult problems. And I really believe in that, and I think I thrive on that. And the second one is just four words, and that is even more resonant to me, the phrase. And, uh, you know, Bani asked uh, Mr. Tata uh, uh, the, the advice that says there are many more people and there are a lot of arrogance, a lot of celebrity CEOs. But I do live with a forward sentence that resonates with me, which says that uh, all glory is fleeting. And it really, really is. Thank you.